part of my identity. But why? Why am I so attracted to images and ideas that seem geared to repulse me? People have been on my ass about it since my bar mitzvah. Why do you like these horror films? Because uh, they're... <laughs> yeah, gross. They're gross. No, no, no. They're not gross. And over 25 years later, I still don't have a clear answer. I've never felt the need to think much about it, let alone explain it to anyone. But since becoming a dad, I've adopted a more critical view of, well, everything, especially myself. And for the critical eye, horror gives you a lot to chew on. Right now, I feel as if horror is riding a crest of popularity unmatched in previous eras. Conventions and film festivals are popping up everywhere. Zombies are flooding cities across the globe. So now is the perfect time to dig deeper. I need to look beyond my own experiences and see what horror was like before movies, theater, or even the written word. I need to talk to filmmakers, artists, and academics, anyone with insight into why so many of us live to be scared. I need to know why horror. To shed some light on why I became a horror fan, it's best to start with the people who were there from the beginning. My family. I think that part of it may have had to do with trying to somehow get over some fears maybe, some scary stuff that, you know, if you can't beat them, join them, or let's explore this and see what this is really about. Uh, like, what are some of the horror movies I used to watch over and over again? Uh, I remember a lot of Nightmare on Elm Street. Remember Burial Ground? I do. I remember, I remember movies before. with uh, Michael. With, Michael. with a 10 year old zombie kid? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what does he do? No, he bites her, he bites her boob off. He bites his mom's boob. <laughs> <laughs> it's like very hard to watch. It's so good. It's hard to explain why exactly we love horror because everyone loves it for different reasons. But as children, generally, kids love, love fairy tales and fairy tales are very very dark and very scary and their children being baked in ovens and being eaten by monsters and witches and horrible horrible things but as a child the world is such a strange and mysterious and terrifying place that when you hear these stories it actually helps you deal with that fear if you read the 16th century version of um the Charles Perrault uh, tale of Red Riding Hood buckets of blood buckets of blood I mean that is what we would understand by horror traditional horror today There was that period, I think at 12 and 13, you want something a little harder. You're not a little kid anymore. You don't want to watch little kid movies. You don't want to watch the Herbie movies or, you know, the animated movies. You want something that's a little more gruesome. I remember it really well when I was a kid and uh, going to see movies. I really would try very, very hard to get into the cinema to see some of these movies. And then when I got inside, they really scared the shit out of me. And I remember thinking, why am I fighting so hard to get in here? And now I want to get the hell out of here. It almost felt like that was my proper mitzvah. I felt like I'd become a man. I'd watched a horror film and, you know, I was buzzing. The moment for me was Eileen took me to go see Summer School. And in the movie were two guys who were completely into horror movies and makeup. And they would prank their classmates and pull skin off their face. And all they ever wanted to do, they were bribed into doing their homework by their teacher who let them watch the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in class after the fact. And I said, holy shit, I want to be these guys. But what did I, I mean, I did makeup effects on you guys, and you guys were very patient slash afraid I would kill you. That was, that was the worst experience. It was the best when it was done, but I remembered that ammonia smell from the liquid latex and mm -hmm. wanting to barf. So it did get you into trouble occasionally. Uh, and that, that little incident when your youngest brother was going to a preschool in a, in a Jewish day school. From what I was told, before I can remember, you uh, did a big burn scar on my forehead. Not on his forehead, but on his cheek. Mm -hmm. So it kind of took up about a good half, I would say a third to a half of his cheek. And it looked oozing and there was like pieces of cornflakes. Yeah, I put Rice Krispies <laughs> in his face to look like little bumps. So I didn't think anything of it. And Aviv goes to the class and they asked him what happened. And he said, my brother did it, which was absolutely true. And the uh, early childhood educator lost her shit they thought his brother took an iron to his face, and when I came to pick him up, there was uh, children's services. Yeah, talking to him, and I go, oh, this, here. <laughs> they just pulled it off. And, and they said, Aviv, why didn't you tell us? He said, I told you my brother did it. What kind of fucking <laughs> <laughs> You're awful. <laughs> but I think that's from watching, like, from watching summer school, 
You got into the idea of ruining people's day. Why I love this stuff so much is that it's tied into my childhood. And it's not only tied into some of the traumas and upsets, but it's tied into a lot of the good stuff. You know, these are fun, nostalgic memories I have of growing up. Again, all based around movie culture, all based around feeling scared. It's the only genre of film that affects you for the rest of your life. When you see Jaws, every time you go to the ocean, every time for the rest of your life, even if it's on some little subconscious level, for a millisecond, you hesitate before putting your foot in the water. Especially as adolescents, we're very afraid of our emotions. I mean, our bodies are changing. We have these powerful urges that we don't understand. We have these feelings that are new and, and almost incomprehensible. Uh, so we're, we're really afraid of our emotions. We're afraid of, of the possibility of losing control. And I think that for, for adolescent boys and maybe increasingly for adolescent girls nowadays, you go to the horror film as a way of learning that actually you're not going to lose it if you're confronted by something that's very fearsome and, and, and disgusting. It's a, a rite of passage. Ask anybody, what was the first horror film that scared you? And they remember it. They remember the theater, they remember the day. It's almost like a first crush. That time that you were in a theater and the movie really spoke to you. Something beyond comprehension is happening to a little girl on the street in this house. A man has been sent for as a last resort to try and save her. I remember specifically watching The Exorcist uh, with my parents, and it's scaring the ever-loving hell out of me. I was like 14 or something. But for some reason, the next day, I woke up, and the first thing I wanted to do was watch it again. Is The Exorcist scary? Is my skin brown? I mean, this, what are we doing here? I mean, is The Exorcist scary? It's, of course it is. I dare you to cross this line into this theater and sit through this movie and not be affected by it. You know, you have like the, the, the bravado attitude and then you have the, the more, uh, you know, like scary ones and the people that leave in the room because they cannot watch the movie anymore. And, and it's very interesting. It tells you a lot about the people that you are like, uh, uh, you know, with at that time. William Friedkin always called it a safe darkness. And I always felt that was a great phrase for it, where you could you know, join in, you could all be frightened of the same thing. And then of course, when it was all over, you could all laugh together because you think, oh, well, you know, we've got over that. It's a bonding process. It's a process that unites us as people. I think there's a sense of community in a horror film, especially in an audience. You're screaming and you, your girl's putting her arms around you and you get to comfort her. There's nothing better. I always remember in horror studies, in kind of uh, academic writing about horror studies, uh, there's always the joke that uh, men bring women to horror films so that they'll jump in their arms, but most of the time they spend their <laughs> the whole film trying to be very, very uh, stoic so that they themselves don't look uh, fearful in front of women. Often pheromones are going crazy. There have been studies that couples that go on dates to horror movies, that leads to hooking up more uh, because you're grabbing your date's arms. a very, very physical experience. Researchers have named this phenomenon the snuggle theory. When we were trying to look at this, it was at the, uh, the gender roles when people watch horror movies. And does the behavior of the male or the female affect the enjoyment of the, of the horror? And also does, the, does it affect how the, the perception of the other person? The study set up a blind date situation. Subjects were paired with actors who were instructed to act courageous, neutral, or scared during the film. At the end of the test, researchers collected information based on how the subjects reacted. The premise of this research was that traditionally, guys need to prove themselves. In the old days, they went out to kill the bear, or they were exposed to all kinds of dangers. So we kind of lost this as a, as a socialization tool. And so in, in this context, we can use horror or scary material or fear as, as a substitute for this. So guys can show their courage. And on the other hand, uh, girls, they can show their need for protection. The snuggle theory showed that males were attracted to females who were scared by the film, but less attracted to females who liked it. On the other hand, women found men who acted courageous to be more attractive, regardless of their looks. There was no better way to get a girl to get really close to you than take her to a horror movie. <laughs> Is Alien showing? Because that always works. That's better than a wine cooler. Let's see if we can do that. When I was growing up a horror fan, I could really feel the stigma associated with the genre. Film critics like Gene Siskel weren't shy about expressing how they felt. I am seeing something on the screen and repulsed by it. I am sitting there dreading another needle in the eyeball. I am dreading another incision across the scalp and the peeling back of the scalp. That's dread. That is not horror and that's not entertainment. It is dread. Even politicians somehow felt threatened by it. 
this is not a censorship issue at all. There is just no question in my mind, I don't think there's a question in anybody's mind, that slasher films do not meet any community standard. When I started high school, I didn't really know any other horror fans, so it wasn't hard for me to find the one other kid who was. My friend Jesse. We met at Crescent School, and uh, we both started putting up pictures of, like, makeup effects in our lockers. Yeah. We shared an affinity for similar things, and... Um, yeah. Severed heads and severed heads and Tom Savini and, and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, my, yeah, that was my introduction of my place in the world as a mm. horror fan. You weren't going to be the popular dude. You were going to be the nerd that gets the nickname and that teacher looking at you out of the corner of his eye when you're the horror fan. We were very harmless. I mean, like you know, we weren't up to anything other no. than um, trying to figure out how we could get like makeup grade silicone and latex yeah. shipped to us from the states or yeah. something like that i don't think it was particularly diabolical like do you think we like that stuff because other people didn't is there is there any mm. of that there it did give us a very distinct identity yeah. from from anyone else and i think i would argue with you and i we probably really wanted to be distinct from the larger identity and uh, sort of culture there so it's obvious jesse and i and people like us share a love of horror but what drives our obsession are humans somehow built to enjoy being scared? The biggest fear, which is universal, starts with our earliest ancestors, is, is the fear of the dark, the fear of the unknown, the fear of uh, places we can't uh, see. I mean, once humans were very small and there were very big predatory beasts out there that were preying on us. Millions of years ago, I, I mean, some, some residue of that must remain in the human cerebellum somewhere. So is it necessary to scare ourselves? Is this a vital part of what we are? Um, I don't know if it's necessary, but again, it is part of the fabric of humanity. Since, probably since cavemen used to sit around an open flame and point at pictures on walls and go, oh my God, right? It's just what we do. So one reason for the longevity of, of horror is that these emotions actually served a very important function uh, for most of human existence. If we can uh, ignite or undergo certain emotional states without having to pay the price, there'll be an evolutionary reason for it too, that we should keep those emotions in working order. After all, we may need them someday. <laughs> お、恐れ恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ、恐れ
Well, we're at Grand River Hospital and we're in the MRI facility. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to put you in the magnet and we're going to have you watch horror movies. And we're going to have you watch non-horror movies. And later on, we can sort of contrast what happens in your brain when you watch those two different types of movies. So you're going to lie down there with uh, some, some TV cameras in front of your eye and we'll play these for you. And your job's pretty simple. You're just supposed to watch them and enjoy them in whatever way you normally do. And then we'll see what happens in your brain. Well, <laughs> it's put me in the sausage machine, I guess. All right, Charles, so now you're going to be watching the horror movies, OK? So, like I said, your job is simple. Just uh, just watch what you watch what's on the screen. You OK and ready to start? I just want to scratch myself. OK, OK. <laughs> Now's the time, not while this thing's on. Looks like a relatively normal brain so far. How was that, Tell? Best. <laughs> nice. All right, they're coming in to get you. Sounds good. So, how did it go? The scariest part for me was right in the beginning. You're when going you, into the magazine. When you started strapping me in and you're talking, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and then you put the headphones on me. Uh, yeah. And then I can't <laughs> hear, and then my, my vision's restricted by the basket on my head, and my heart really started going. But inside, once we started going... The horror relaxed you. The you <laughs> Well, that's great. We'll crush the numbers and we'll see what happens in your brain. Okay. <laughs> so, Del, this is a 3D model of your head. We'll get inside it in a second and have a look at the brain and what's actually looking at. The part of my brain responsible for facial recognition was more active during the horror scenes, like in the movie Zombie, than in non-horror films. For most people, this isn't the case. However, this wasn't the only part of my brain that reacted. We see these activations towards the back in what's called parietal cortex. That part of the brain is important for focusing our attention. So when you're watching the horror movies, you're more engaged by it, and so you just really focus your attention on those, um, those scenes, and you're just more engaged by them. That isn't really making you afraid, it's actually getting you hooked in and watching more intently and closely. The test shows that because I've seen so many horror movies, I've effectively conditioned my fear of them out of my brain. It turns out I've been fighting this fear since I was a kid. You were always very creative and, and, and artistic and you did beautiful pictures that very quickly, I mean, I think by the age of five, they all had monsters in them. In grade 10, my art teacher said that my stuff, he took me aside and said, you know, this is the kind of stuff that serial killers draw. I always thought that some of these paintings that you had, some of these pictures, were reflective of some pain that you were experiencing internally. And for me, the fact that you were putting it on canvas and expressing it was a good sign. I never thought you were on the track to be a serial killer. Like I said, many of our friends and family were really not impressed with our, shall we call it, laissez-faire attitude towards Tal's artistic inclinations. <laughs> but they're shitheads, though, right? They're all shitheads, yes. Horrific imagery has always had a place in visual art. Early humans painted monsters on their walls. Dante's Divine Comedy inspired terrifying renditions of hell. And Hieronymus Bosch created the Garden of Earthly Delights, depicting sublimely nightmarish visions of good versus evil. Part of the, the remit of any visual representation, any work of art, there's a desire, whether it's a poem, a song, or a movie, or a painting, to move the viewer, so that the viewer, through the confrontation with this work, will somehow be changed afterwards. In the case of violent images in a religious context, it is to inspire, perhaps, the viewer to greater piety. There's no question that there's a history in the art world of horror, because, uh, you know, before the technology we had of moving images, we just had the single still image. You'll find certainly in the domination from the great religions in the great art, some really savage, brutal material. And I think what uh, people often forget is that in the historical moment before cinema, places like churches often served as places of entertainment, a venue for entertainment. Viewers would be moved by the pathos and shocked perhaps also by the violence. Um, but at the same time, it would have had a very strong message about moral values, what is good, what is wrong. As art and culture progressed, biblical motifs were replaced by more contemporary themes. In 18th century England, artist William Hogarth produced the Four Stages of Cruelty. These groundbreaking prints, laced with satire and graphic violence, acted as a harsh message for the working class. 
I tracked down a rare set in a small London print shop. So what we're seeing here are Hogarth's Four Stages of Cruelty. Uh, what makes these quite interesting is that we have a, a narrative, we have a, a character who you see uh, taken through his initial cruelties um, to animals uh, uh, and um, within this context of um, quite an unpleasant London at the time. Uh, you go through to the second stage where you see um, the scenario where, again, animals are just treated abominably. Um, uh, I think we have some uh, representatives of the law here. And so we're kind of looking at crime and punishment. And in the third stage, we see that he's actually uh, murdered this poor woman. Uh, he's graduated from animals to absolutely, people. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And then we have this fantastic finale, which is this amazing disemboweling. A, a guy's been caught, he's been punished, he's been hung, uh, and now he's been um, pulled apart for the purpose of medical experimentation. And, uh, and the, dog, the dog gets the last laugh, really. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> in the first, um, the first image, we see a dog being cruelly uh, penetrated and it's rectum by an arrow yeah. uh, for pleasure. Whereas here, the dog, of course, is eating out the heart. Very That's why I like vicious character. I always like dogs better than I like people. I mean, <laughs> that reason. What would purchasers of these prints have done with them? Like, hang out them in their homes, or? I think he would have envisaged them probably being glued on pub walls. And right. So when Hogarth created these things, he wanted to scare people. He wanted to really yeah. kind of po poke them with a stick. I think they were meant to be, yes. I think if there's anything in the horror motif which starts here, certainly into, into the contemporary cinema, you know, it's that uh, ultimately, you know, there are good people and you want people to be good people and that the bad people are always considered bad and they get punished at the end of it. Though. But people ask me, you know, how can you look at this stuff and take enjoyment from it? I don't necessarily look at the yeah. stuff in the way that, you know, someone would eat a cupcake. It's not that no. kind of enjoyment, you know? It's, it's not that kind of thing. It's definitely a reminder of our mortality and, and to be a good person and to... Uh, and to know that you know bad things happen and life while you have it is, is worth mm. pursuing to the fullest. Hogarth used brutal images as a means of moral instruction. Good won over evil. 60 years later, Francisco Goya's The Disasters of War portrayed humanity at its worst. His graphic point-blank images of torture and agony spoke to the futility of armed conflict. Intenta contar, pues bueno, demostrar de una manera cruda lo locos que estamos, ¿no? Que es un poco lo que hacemos cuando hacemos una película de terror, ¿no? The Disasters of War is a series of 80 plates uh, that Goya etched in the early 19th century, which were produced uh, as a result of his touring Spain during uh, and after the Peninsula War, when uh, the French forces invaded and sparked a uh, calamitous uh, battle which saw scenes of outrageous cruelty. What Goya does is that he puts the dead, the tortured, the women being raped, cities on fire, bodies piled up on the forefront of, of the images. In many respects, Goya was one of the first war artists. Um, obviously, war had been the subject of works of art for centuries before. That isn't the new thing. But what is particularly inspiring and dramatic here is that he depicted war from a neutral standpoint, from a dispassionate standpoint. He is looking at this and recording not the victory of one side or the other or the valiant defenders. Or... There's no spin to it. He is just pointing out how brutal man can be under certain circumstances. Es una gozada Goya. Goya fue el primero, ¿no? Goya fue el primero de nosotros. You can see how uh, there were artists back in the prior centuries that uh, probably would have made great horror filmmakers, but uh, they didn't have the technology. Baby, I would never cheat on you. And I never have. Art and culture have forever strove to address life's mysteries, the most present being death. But how exactly can we explore something that we know so little about? Horror may be a necessity to the extent that who knows what's coming. I mean, I think that's the old thing, the mystery of what's happening, what, what will happen next, what is death, what is, what's coming, what, what's, is, is there an afterlife, is there not, is it just gonna end? I wanna die! Yeah! Death happens for everybody. And so this is really at odds with our animal instinct for self-preservation. And on the one hand, we're biologically driven to continue living. But on the other hand, we're capable of knowing that you know, ultimately this, we're going to fail at this. And so this creates a certain anxiety in us that would bog us down in our daily activities. Right? What's the point of doing anything at all if it's all just going to be erased by death? I'm not sure that there's much else in horror. It all comes down to that fear of death. You know, we're obsessed with this idea of dying. I'm probably a little more equipped to deal with death, disease, personal tragedy than some other people because I've seen this kind of played out and it makes me think about how I would react 
in these situations with these misfortunes. Now I hear something. Stop! Stop! So somebody who maybe consumes horror or fear-producing stimuli on a regular basis, uh, maybe somebody who just can see the illusions for what they are and maybe has a sense about what they're trying to cover up. Approaching these fear-producing uh, stimuli can be a more authentic way of existing, really, where you're not trying to avoid and deny your emotions, but rather approach them and actually feel them and experience them. Too much blood. And I can see your gaunch. Just do it. There are things that are beyond our control. And when you watch a horror movie, it gives you a safe structure where you're allowed to be scared and let those feelings out and deal with them in a way that you're talking about something objective rather than openly admitting what, what terrifies you, which is very hard for people to do. So there's a number of ways that we manage anxieties about death. And in short, we do so by creating culture. Culture offers uh, ways of thinking about things, ways of talking about things, ways of viewing the world, essentially, that take us out of our subjectivity and kind of objectifies reality in a way. Right? So now it's not just my experience of things, everybody's experiencing things the same way. Right? We're kind of sharing that experience, so I'm not so much alone anymore. Looking cross-culturally at horror, um, you can see a lot of indications of what different cultures fear, what bothers them, how they approach, even their belief systems and how they approach life and death. I do think that in, in our society, in, uh, in North America particularly, we don't have a very healthy attitude towards death. It's generally we need to avoid it. And this is not true for all cultures. In terms of the way other cultures look at it, um, you know, death and dying is more present in their culture. I mean, in many Eastern uh, countries, the deceased stays with the family, and the family actually uh, washes the body and dresses it for the funeral and, and, and possibly carries it and buries it themselves. But the concept of, of death and everything, especially, uh, say, in Mexico, is like the Dia de los Muertos, like all of that is something that is, is very common, like dealing with death, dealing, dealing with uh, the concept that they are ghosts is something that is, like, natural. Every November, Mexican families get together to celebrate El Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead. This tradition dates back centuries. En realidad, el Día de Muertos está en mucho marcando un ciclo festivo que tiene que ver con la producción vida y muerte del maíz. Y es la, el momento de la abundancia para que tú, a tus ancestros, a los antepasados, les puedas entregar un poco de lo que te ayudan ellos desde la tierra, porque ellos son enterrados. Y se dice que en Xochimilco a los, a los hombres no se les entierra, sino que se les siembra. In North America, kids are generally protected from the idea of death. We don't have anything quite like this. The closest thing to Day of the Dead that I know of is Halloween, when we wear costumes, gorge on candy, and try to scare each other. However, our annual tradition is beginning to creep into Mexican culture. La cultura nacional ha estado fuertemente impactada por lo que es el Halloween y por estas imágenes que no forman parte necesariamente de nuestra cultura y vuelven tenebroso lo que no lo, lo que no es a nadie le parecería lógico que tú le pongas una ofrenda y le enciendas una flor a un ente que te va a venir a hacer daño entonces está esta presión que dice que el día de muertos es para espantarse para tener miedo y no es así Mexico was a real eye opener for me there they look at death not as something to fear but as a natural part of existence sure this doesn't answer every question but at least it lifts some of the anxiety that gets in the way of enjoying life. In 1764, English author Horace Walpole wrote The Castle of Otranto. Walpole didn't know it at the time, but he started a new genre, Gothic literature. Probably what makes the Gothic novel the beginning of, of modern horror, if you want, is that the 18th century is also a century where the importance of the of external stimuli on our minds is properly understood. I think Gothic is like horror, it's, it's become a genre that we look back on that's, that has a lot of motifs associated with it, um, which are dark castles, that sort of usually set in a far back historical period, um, slightly erotic elements, um, this sort of conflict between the rational and irrational all the time. Some of horror's most enduring characters, including the aristocratic vampire and Frankenstein's monster, have roots in gothic fiction. Mary Shelley, I just love for so many reasons. One, because one of the most horrific novels of all time was written by a 19-year-old woman.
I think Shelley was already trying to do something new with the Gothic. I don't know if you know the story behind the creation of uh, the novel Frankenstein. It was 1816. They call it the year without a summer because it rained all summer. And the sort of, I guess, at the time, titans of, of English literature, Lord Byron, John Polidori, Percy Shelley, the poet, his wife Mary Gordon, they ended up in this villa on Lake Geneva in Switzerland during this rainy summer where they didn't get to go outside. So they basically just stayed inside and told each other scary stories. And the challenge there was pretty much to try and come up with something that was different. And uh, Frankenstein emerged out of that kind of uh, challenge. So a lot of the roots of horror literature actually come from this one time, you know, in 1816, with these very specific writers. The Gothic movement marked a critical phase when horror went from moral instruction into pure entertainment. Centuries later, the popularity of horror literature shows the written word still holds the power to chill us to the bone. Reading horror is maybe a little bit more cerebral. You're taking your time with it and you're thinking about less visceral things that are happening. It's sort of the complexity of a plot, of the different characters and their involvement and how the characters will turn out. I think the best Gothic novels, the best horror uh, texts, have a strong fear component and a strong um, sense of wanting to disturb, to transgress. But, but they are kind of um, also studies into things that, that worry us, like psychology, like why are we here? Um, can we go beyond our physical limitations? But also, any work of art would have also strove towards trying to entertain, to please, to move, and to instruct the viewer in the way that cinema does for us today. And now, a way too brief history of horror cinema. We begin in the silent era. George Méliès produces several influential short films, surrealist phantasmagoria that gives way to a wave of silent horror around the world, most notably in America and Germany. Obviously, the German Expressionism was just a magical time, and the design and the, the art direction in those films and the, the, so wonderfully stylized and creating mood. The 1930s are the golden age of monster movies. Lavish productions inspired by literature and folklore are brought to life by Universal Studios. The Mummy, Frankenstein, and Dracula are still as iconic now as they were then. It was Universal horror films that really brought Dracula and vampires into uh, Western popular culture. I mean, it had been there in literature, but sort of more for a mass uh, audience, really, uh, who are looking for that kind of entertainment. In the 40s, House of Dracula, The Invisible Man Returns, and Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein proves that the genre had been saturated with endless sequels and comedy hybrids. But by the time the Second World War ends, classic monsters are replaced with a new threat. The Godzilla movies very much came out of fear of atomic radiation, but then we had our own version of, you know, giant ants and giant bugs and the mole people and, and things from atomic radiation. That was very much in the 50s. In 1960, Alfred Hitchcock gives us our most shocking monster yet, the unassuming Boy Next Door. A few years later, the gore film is born in a splash of blood and viscera. By mid-decade, horror is booming on an international scale. Britain's Hammer Studios leads the way, returning to the pool of gothic literature that inspired horror's golden age. Hammer Studios were, uh, made a lot of films in the um, 60s, which were kind of quite high budget, high production value gothic horrors and they went back to kind of the universal um, set of creatures so they looked at Dracula and Frankenstein and the mummy. And then in 68 all hell breaks loose. Night of the living dead. In the 70s you could feel what happened with the Vietnam War and all of a sudden we get the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Last House on the Left and you know, even Toby Hooper says that he felt with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you used to be living in a Norman Rockwell painting and now you're living next door to the Manson family. The rise of cults sets off a wave of popular satanic-themed movies with The Exorcist and The Omen. And a giant mechanical shark launches horror to new heights of popularity. At the same time, Italy is pumping out its most recognizable export, the giallo. They are sensual, uh, visceral, uh, emotional experiences, and that's what makes them so great. Fuck character, fuck narrative, fuck logic, you don't need that. They're dreamlike, they're beautiful, and uh, there's just something so alien and wonderful about them. By the end of the decade, George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead brings flesh-eating zombies back to life, and John Carpenter's Halloween opens the door for the slasher plays. Psycho killers stalk their victims from campsites, suburban homes, and even their dreams. In the 80s, filmmakers take their bloody imaginations to another level. Makeup artists are the stars of the day, and the films revolve around their creations. The genre is fitted with a cleaner and safer appearance in the 90s. Mainstream fright flicks take the form of attractive teen movies, self-referential slashers, and horror disguised as dark thrillers. 
if I made a movie about a guy who you know, kidnaps and skins women and holds them in a hole, it'd be a horror movie. It'd probably be an NC-17 horror movie. You know, but if you put you know Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins in it and uh, and it's put out by a major studio, it wins Oscars and it's Silence of the Lambs. But by the end of the millennium, The Blair Witch Project and The Ring blindside audiences, making horror scary again. In the time since, digital technology has smashed down international borders. Horror is now seen and produced in more countries than it's ever been before. I've seen enough horror movies to know that I have a dark side. I suspect everyone does. We all seem to have a monster inside of us. But what makes us who we are is how we choose to face it. I feel that some of our movies and those villains are like the mirror of ourself. When it's about the fight between good and evil on screen, it's also the fight between good and evil inside ourself. Humanity needs monsters. We need monsters to explain um, the mysteries of the universe or at least project, you know, our fears and anxieties onto some other creature that's not like us. That then we can go out and kill and that sort of, now we're done. The imaginary monster is, I, I think, our way of envisioning all of that evil within ourselves and all of the danger in the world in an object that's made up. And if you make it up, you can control it. If you make it up, you can write a story about it. You can kill it off, it always comes back. But at least you're in control. And some audio movies bringing you this extreme uh, interpretation of who we are, but we don't want to admit. And I think that's really like a, one of the main function of the genre is to help people to see their dark side somehow. We like to be scared. We learn something from it. It's, it's an education in self-control. It's also a, a kind of a delving into the soul. We, we want to know ourselves better. And it's a part of us that's dark. Some people are offended by it. Some, as always, some people are offended by violence and blood and gore and war. But to say that those things don't exist, I, I think is more dangerous than the monsters themselves. I think that the first step to enlightenment is recognition of the dangers that lurk in, in our soul. Man is not truly one, but two. Now, supposing we could break that chain, separate those two selves, free the good in man and let it go on to its higher destiny and segregate the bad. Let it destroy itself in its own degradation. But there's always going to be that uh, section of society that thinks there's something wrong with you because you indulge in um, those types of narratives. You invite that darkness into your life. And so sometimes they don't get that. The big irony is that those are the same people that are watching real life atrocities on CNN, on TV. Really, I think that if you, if you want real horror, just read the newspapers, right? Uh, read the newspapers and, and go online and look at what's happening in the world. And you'll constantly be shocked and amazed at, at uh, the deaths that people can sink to or uh, you know, the level of depravity that, that is out there every day in society. Is it more mentally sound to, you know, watch fiction about monsters and blood and atrocity and gore? or to watch real-life news footage of actual people dying and getting killed. I thought I liked horror and scary stuff very much. So there was a movie that I saw, and I think I would have been 16 or something like that, a Dario Argente movie, Four Flies on Grey Velvet. Argento. What did I call him? Argente. He should have changed his name a long time ago. Um, You're embarrassing Ar me. <laughs> Let's just send this out. That's Let's awesome. just call him Dario. <laughs> yeah, Dario. Um, and I remember walking home from the theater and being so scared. I could hear the leaves moving in the trees. I was just so scared. And that was it. From then on, it was very clear to me. I'm never watching another movie that scares me. Horror can trigger a physical response. We scream, our pupils dilate, and our heart rate increases. My mom and I are at the University of Toronto. We're here to compare the physiological reactions of someone who loves horror to someone who does her best to avoid it. Sorry, Mom. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Hi. It's Hal. Hal, yes. I'm Liz. I know that. Nice to meet you. This, is, uh, to meet this you. is a victim? Oh, <laughs> wonderful. I mean, uh, subject? Yes, indeed. <laughs> we'll be subjecting you to interesting things. Shall All we right. proceed on into the lab? Sure. Thank you. 
what we're gonna do is I'm gonna bring you into the room and connect you to a bunch of sensors uh, that will be measuring your heart rate as well as the amount of blood flowing in your torso, the amount of electricity your skin conducts, as well as the temperature of your skin, all these good things. And while I'm measuring those things, we're gonna have you first start off watching a calming nature video that is supposed to get your normal resting levels of all of these physiological measures. Then we're gonna show you film clips uh, of different subgenres of horror and see how your body responds in these contexts. Now specifically what we're interested in is whether or not you have a stress response at all when watching the horror movies relative to you know just your resting baseline. So it's pretty important that to know that she doesn't like horror and that I like horror and we're looking for the different sort of responses between the, the two kind of people. Indeed. And also how much you guys correlate as well while watching the movies. So do you even respond the same way while you're taking in the stimuli? I shouldn't have admitted to what I'm really scared of. <laughs> That's right. Oh. This is the blood that is coming out of both Tal and his mother. Again, Tal's mom is on the top and Tal is on the bottom. <laughs> He's probably chill. She's still a little bit wigged out, I think. Hi, get uh, <laughs> oh my god. Why are you laughing? I'm not looking. It's scary. I'm not looking. You have to look. I can't look. I can't look. You have to. No, I don't. I can't. There's nothing. There's nothing. Watch. <laughs> ah, shit. Oh my god. The results show that at the beginning of the test, my mom and I had different levels of both heart rate and heart contractions. But as the footage became more intense, gruesome, and horrific, our levels started to converge, and our internal responses became nearly identical. And even though my mom was more scared than I was, physiologically speaking, we had a shared experience. So given the results, can you tell, without knowing who we are, who loves horror and who hates horror within the, the results of this study? I would need to observe many more people, but here's why. Because I would have expected that the person who doesn't love horror would become much more stressed out. But as I said, it seemed, if anything, that you had the greatest degree of arousal. Yeah. So I could I could have told a difference between you, but I would have made the wrong guess really? as to who was the horror lover and who hated it. Yeah. <laughs> One of the most prevalent stigmas attached to horror is misogyny. And at first glance, it's easy to see why. But if that's true, why do so many women love horror? I mean, obviously there's a ton of books that have been written about the portrayal of women in horror. Um, probably the most notable, which is uh, Carol Clover's Men, Women, and Chainsaws. She was one of the major proponents of slasher films not being as misogynistic as people think because uh, there's the whole concept of the final girl, which is that um, almost as a rule, there's a, f a lone woman who survives at the end of these films and that the audience for the films will tend to identify with her. I don't know why Texas Chainsaw, all these movies that, you know, there's this woman who survives and sometimes you don't see it coming. I mean, she's not strong along the way, but, you know, she's the cutie pie that survives and at the end manages to, you know, stick something into the guy's brain. Typically in horror movies, I think you see women being defiled a lot more than men. It's just sort of natural. And I think it's a natural tendency of a man to want to protect women. I've never seen a huge difference between women fans and male fans, except women fans often come to us and say, thank God you're doing what you're doing because now it's okay for me to say that I like horror. And it's really shitty for me to think that an industry or like a genre where you have the final girl and you have that empowering feeling for women and still women are made to feel like, oh, it's weird that you like horror or you're not a real horror fan or that kind of bullshit. Jason's reign of terror is over. For a long time, um, when you pitch to, you know, to various markets, people would tell me, um, women don't watch horror, you know, it's, a, it's for the pimply 18-year-old boy, and I was like, well, I'm a woman and I watch horror, so I, I, I think it's important to be, actually be making films that you want to see. I've heard that 60% of the horror viewing audience is female, and uh, the nice thing is that uh, there are more characters reflecting the modern woman. For one, the vast majority of the fans. I think, you know, that's a big misconception. I just know from sitting at my table that I sell more horror to women than anybody else. I don't quite understand people sort of um, stereotyping of women not being interested in horror um, because it's a, an area of sort of stories that kind of so, so pertinent to women. Who's the guy? 
Who's the guy here? Huh? Who's the fucking guy here? <laughs> the Tony Production, yeah? Oh, I'm so sorry. Wait a second. You're fucking hilarious, boy. Certainly the horror filmmaking and filmmaking in general has always been a 100% male-dominated uh, industry and now uh, you know it, society is changing and uh, there are places uh, available now for women to express themselves in horror. The reaction I tend to get as a female filmmaker who makes horror is usually surprise at least from people um, who are a little older and, and you know have certain expectations on what women want to do and so and I think that that's what we're struggling with when it comes to Hollywood which is when they keep telling us as female directors that your stuff isn't commercial. I think kind of the success of female filmmakers like the Suska Sisters is almost indicative of the fact that there is this like vacuum in the horror industry and people want to see women making horror movies and female fans want to see films by female directors that they can identify with on that level. And then there's some other females that say, oh, you're working in horror, I'm sorry, something better will come along. Yes, I chose horror. Yeah. I love horror. I, I would not do anything that I'm not a fan of. There are several cultures in which women play a vital role in horror stories, and some of the most compelling examples come from Japan. Japanese horror is some of the most frightening stuff I've ever seen. Many of the archetypes that dominate modern cinema date as far back as the 12th century, where ghosts haunted the stages of no and kabuki theater. In no theater, you have stock characters. You have male or female or old men, and they all have different types of masks. And one of the stock characters is this idea of the um, vengeful, the onryo, the, the female ghost who comes back from the dead. Kabuki te to wa desu ne, sono no sai san. Hondai wa ano nante kana shomin no tame no goraku datta desu ne, mukashi wa. De sono yurei to yu no mo ano taiyan de jisa ano nihon no yurei te dai katachi kimatte ru desu yo, mukashi no amashite no wa. The most famous motif would be the vengeful female ghost, who is typically a woman who has been wronged, and you know this very motif that, that you always see with the uh, the lank black hair, the white smock that they wear comes from the funereal outfit they wear when they're burying the corpses. This is to show that she's risen from the from the grave. And a lot of it has to do with the constraints that women are under in certain types of cultures where they don't have any way of speaking out, they don't have any way of uh, asserting themselves in a societally acceptable way. そう the Japanese culture comes out of their acceptance of life and death and, and understanding that the cycle of life it, it comes through in, the, in, their, in their filmmaking because literally everything's about ghosts and the afterlife which if you're making an American movie, you gotta explain all that stuff. You know, you gotta get people to get to the point of, oh, there are ghosts, now I believe in it. But the Japanese movie, you just throw it out there, there are ghosts in this building, and everybody's like, yeah, 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 I got that. There are some just fantastic movies in the 90s that were imported to America, you know, when I saw them, uh, like Juwan, The Grudge, and uh, The Ring films. And uh, they really tapped into the Japanese obsession with ghost stories. And I think it was a, a revelation for American audiences. Uh, in 1997, Japanese 
one of the reasons for the popularity of the J-horror boom is that these films were scary. They weren't relying on sort of in-jokes and, and jumps and scares. Not something very self-referential and jokey, but actually something that was just scary and unsettling. Visiting Japan proved what I had always suspected, that horror is a truly universal expression. I was delighted to learn that Tokyo has bars and restaurants that celebrate the macabre. It was in one such place that I found kindred spirits that spoke the same language as I do. The language of horror. Hey, how's it going? Ciao. Are there a lot of bars like this in, in Tokyo? I think I see a bars like that. I'll, I'll tell you how many bars like this there are in Toronto. Zero. That's Nothing. Too bad. It is too bad, because that's where I would hang out. Even though my new friends and I grew up on opposite sides of the world, we bonded over our shared experiences. I was making those uh, special effects. Oh, masks and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have similar pictures of me when I was 14, 15 years old, putting bullet holes in my brother's head. Yeah, yeah. I did the same thing. Then put something in a picture, and the teacher went crazy, and I was, I was sent right to the, uh, the medical care. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. We did that all the time. I can't believe it. This is so funny. You know, a million miles away, yeah, that's I'm here in Japan, <laughs> and we did the exact same thing when we were kids. One of the most exciting parts of my stay in Tokyo was finding this store, stocked floor to ceiling with VHS tapes. Like so many other fans of my generation, I got my greatest horror education at the local video store. The VHS boom was the proliferation of home video as a, a mass market consumer item because it represented the opportunity for people to own movies. VHS tapes allowed you to kind of you know, where you couldn't get it mainstream, you at least had a source for it, whether it's the library or friends, things like that. So you could read about it in Fango, and instead of me wondering what it was all about, knowing I would never see it, kids nowadays were able to like go get it and trade it and fast forward to that place. Video Boom had a huge impact on horror because it offered an opportunity for a lot of small companies or independent filmmakers to produce something that they knew would sell. If you have a concept that seems horrifying, or if you can package it in a way that seems to suggest it's going to be gory or outrageous, there would be an audience for that. What a day. Like I needed to add another 40 pounds to my luggage. When the Video Boom happened, suddenly there was this log of these movies from the 60s and 70s going into the early 80s that all of a sudden you had access to. The video store was such a huge component of growing up and being a huge movie fan. And my dad would have to drive me to the to the video store and there was a section for horror. So, you know, I always appreciated a good decapitation because my dad did. If I closed my eyes, you know, because it was just really terrifying, he'd stop the VHS, back it up and say, you missed it. Is there anything more fun than putting on a movie and you know, just watch somebody watch it? Because you've seen it so many times, you can just sit back and watch somebody. But I wonder how they're going to react to this. You have to be crazy not to be scared by this or not to laugh at this point. Evil Dead es una película que hay que verla en, con un grupo de amigos. Hay que coger un vídeo, se ve mejor en vídeo que en cine. Hay que coger un vídeo a poder ser un, un vídeo, un VHS con mala calidad, ponerlo en casa, ponerlo en el televisor, muchas palomitas, pizza, cervezas, y todo eso junto genera una fiesta. Es una fiesta. O sea, gritar todos juntos no hay nada más divertido, ¿no? Interesting question, I mean, why is the zombie the heavyweight champ? First of all, I don't, I wouldn't call them heavyweights, but um, I think it's video games. Video games have taken fans from being passive consumers to active participants. In 1994, Shinji Mikami created Resident Evil, which had a profound impact on the gaming industry and horror in general. で、え、the Resident Evil series for me really evolved the blending of sort of Japanese horror and, and sort of American tropes. A lot of it had to do with the setting, uh, the themes that it brought, you know, the tension that it brought, and the emotion that it brought to it. Not, not just on a story level, but just you as, as a player and your engagement level. It's just been profound and it's actually helped, you know, this philosophy of maturity in, the, in, in games. Certainly video games now have a, have a great influence on how kids might, might react when they can walk around as a single person shooter and just blow the hell out of people left and right. For me, I know there's a desire to just kind of fulfill that survival horror fantasy and nothing better than having a world with no rules. I can actually be incredibly violent if I want without any repercussions because they're not, I'm not killing humans. They're, they're kind of, I need to put them out of their misery. So like the best example is, is I think the first Silent Hill. When you first walk into that game, uh, you're walking through the fog with a fire axe 
and one of the first things that attacks you is a crowd of children with tiny knives, and you've got a fire axe. And so, as the game designer, you're saying you can't proceed with this game until you fire axe this crowd of children to death. And that's something that, like, if you made a character in a movie do that, everybody's like, okay, fuck that guy, he fire axes children, I'm done sympathizing with him. Whereas in the game, you just fire axed all those children. Well, video games really, they take you into the experience yourself. You are now in a maybe dark room if you play with the lights off. You know, the zombies are coming directly at you, and it's happening to you. It's not something that you're watching on a stationary screen or you're imagining in your head. If you don't hit the right buttons, you know, those zombies might yet tear you apart. There aren't a lot of movies that I'm too afraid to watch. There are some video games that I'm too afraid to play. And because we're co-gamers, I was born with a player one and a player two. Map maker for life. Yeah, there's, you should see the way we play Resident Evil games and because there's no like real trade-off point. And you're like, oh, I'll play it to the next save point. I'm like, no, that was really short. That was easy. You've got to keep playing. Horror has come a long way since it first got its hooks into me. As a devout fan, I used to feel like an outsider. But these days, I meet fans everywhere I go. Horror is now more popular than it's ever been. There's, um, all sorts of horror fans. A lot of people wear leather and have tattoos. And then there's the other intellectual type of horror person. Very buttoned up and straight-laced. You're proud that you're a horror fan. You're showing the world that, hey, like, I like this stuff, you know, um, there's, there's really nothing wrong with it. I don't know that I'm, like, the super fan that some other people are. But I love the fact that there, there's a whole community of people out there that, that want to talk about the same things that, that I want to talk about, that love monsters and, and aren't afraid of these things and don't think it's weird. Horror is like the most embracive, kind place imaginable. You have horror conventions and you have these big, like, big, scary guys that come over and say, hey, I really, I really like your, your movie. It's, it was cool. Can I, can I get a picture with you ladies? And it's, it just melts your heart and he's covered with tattoos and he's got like a pentagram on his forehead, but it's fine. Hi, John. Pleasure to meet you. My name is Tal. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, I would tell you which one of your films is my favorite, but, you know, a yes for Big Trouble in Little China is a no for Halloween, which is a no for The Thing, and I'm not just gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Right. Like any other horror fan that, uh, you know, sort of proudly wears the horror t-shirts and, you know, isn't afraid to talk about the genre and indulge in it, uh, you do get those looks and those sneers from that section of mainstream society. Uh, not so much anymore because it's been absorbed into larger fan culture and horror has really gone mainstream in a lot of ways. We saw the progression from like B-movies into blockbusters sort of in the 80s as we were uh, dealing with it to now where it's, you know, it's one of the main cycles. It's like I used to tell people my favorite movie in the world was Dawn of the Dead and they would look at me like I was whistling and there's some kind of dog or something like that. But now it's like people eating intestines, cannibalism, shoot for the head, aim for the brain. That's all popular stuff. Now we have something like The Walking Dead on AMC and uh, you can meet it. Anybody these days, I'm like, oh yeah, I love zombies. I watch The Walking Dead every Sunday. And it's like, I mean, have you ever seen Day of the Dead? I mean, any of that stuff. And it's like, well, no, no, I never made it that far back. But I really like The Walking Dead, and it's just because it's accessible and it's on TV. My mom watching The Walking Dead is like, what the fuck? You know? And she just loves zombies. And, and it's funny because it starts like something that is obscure, like zombie movies made by George Romero. Then it's like, nobody cares about them. Then suddenly they are cool again. The horror fan, the real guy who loves this shit, isn't the guy in the multiplex. The guy bringing his girlfriend to the show, maybe casually likes horror, just wants to maybe get his girlfriend wet in the hopes that he'll get her home and get some nookie later on. He's not a horror movie fan. They don't exist together in the same world. 20 years later, they do. Yay, we're, no we're normal, Tal. We did. It only took uh, however 20, 20 some odd years to do it, but, uh, uh, but we, we got didn't, there. We didn't change for them, though. Yeah, it's, you know, we, now we live in the party that we helped create and move forward, and now we get to enjoy the... As elder statesmen yeah. now, we get to enjoy the fruits of all of that. Good for us, Tal. We did it. <laughs>It's no secret that monsters have a lot to offer young minds. Although, there's a difference between what I call horror and the monsters that help teach my son how to count, identify colors and shapes, or just be secure with being a little different. But hey, every horror fan's gotta start somewhere. Once upon a time, there was a very lonely monster named Lamont. I think fear is something that we universally experience as children, just because there's things that children don't understand and can't understand, and particularly the things that uh, our parents can't explain to us. These things are mysteries to us. But they also teach a lot of lessons, and I think um, some of these are important moral lessons, both to ourselves and to our children. We're brought up with uh, learning about the boogeyman and the monster that will take them away. 
、あのね、恐怖って私は悪くないと思うんですよ、怖いもの流れるということをしておいたら私はいいと思ってるし、自分でね、うん、で怖いことがなぜいけないかと、例えばその人を騙したりとかです、ね、傷つけたりということと、その恐怖というのは全く別ですからね、えー、むしろ自分にも怖いものがあるんだということを昔は教育として階段を教えたわけですよね、階段ってそうだったんですね、教育に使われたんですよ。A lot of、uh, parents now that I see that might be a bit protective, well, it's a little bit like bubble wrap. You know, how much do you want to protect them? And you're better off actually watching it with them rather than actually thinking that your child's gone to moniker as a satanic occultist or something. Children of darkness, repeat after me. Allah! 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 I am s a t a n I'll tell you, I think I speak for your father as well, which I try to do often, right?、Um, Go ahead. We're quite impressed with you. Come on. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very impressive how you took a, a, a hobby from childhood and you actually took it to a level that, that will really go beyond just your own personal interest and、uh, just, just entertainment, but really make it into a, a, a nice exploration of, of this area. This is like the best part of the movie, and kids are screaming. Yeah. Why horror? It's a question with answers as diverse and abundant as the people who enjoy it. When we're talking about like why horror, I don't know if you're saying like why long distance running. You know, like, like why any of the shit that just proves that like we can survive this and humans are awesome. Because we need it, because our cultures need it, because it's, you know, you have to have some bloodletting.、Um, it's, it's, it makes a culture healthy. I mean, I am scared of a lot of things loss, betrayal. Death, anything, a phobia I just mentioned, but cinema and horror cinema helps me deal with it so I can put it off a bit while longer. There are people that don't like horror, and not the people who think it's rubbish, but the people who like, no, 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 I don't like it, I won't watch it, it scares me. I think that's a, as much of an exercise as seeing it. Do you want to go and see whatever the latest horror movie is? No, 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 no. Don't want to go, don't like it. Well, the adrenaline's going, it's kicking in, and the sense of the unknown, the fear of the unknown starts kicking. So I think that's as much of a A fix, ironically, as the people who go, bring it on. I've seen everything, you can't scare me. Ah, but it's just, yeah, it's just, 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 it's Looking back at my life as a horror fan, I've discovered that it's given me a way to master my fears, diffuse my worries, and channel my sometimes dark imagination. Horror is a way to explore aspects of life we're generally taught to avoid. We don't celebrate the pain of others, we transform our own. You don't have to love horror or even like it to recognize that it plays an important role in the way we engage with the world around us. It's safe, it's fun, and sometimes we have to play in the shadows to fully appreciate the good things in life. And that's why horror.